Hello, Keith Kaiser here with another lesson from God's Word. We're doing Luke's Life of Christ, and we're in Luke chapter 20. We're working through our Lord's dialogue with the Sadducees when they tried to make the Lord and his belief in resurrection look silly. They tried to kind of undermine that teaching by positing a situation where in following the Levirate law of a brother marrying his dead brother's widow and raising up a child in the name of the dead brother, that somehow this would lead to all kinds of confusion in the resurrection, that seven brothers, having had one wife, they'd be fighting over that wife in the resurrection, is apparently what they were inferring. But the Lord repudiated that notion by telling them the resurrection isn't about marrying and giving in marriage. It isn't operating according to the same principles of this age. The age to come is the age of the sons of the resurrection. It's a new creation, and it's going to operate on different principles, just like the angels operate on a higher order and a heavenly order of things. So the sons of the resurrection are going to live differently than we do now and live for the glory of God. Well, we pick up the story in Luke chapter 20, Luke 20, and we look at verse 37. The Lord Jesus says, But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised, when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well, but after that, they dared not question him anymore. Now, for any would-be skeptics, for people that want to refute the Lord Jesus Christ, I say have at it. You can go ahead and try and undermine his teaching. You can go ahead and try to contradict the Lord Jesus Christ. But you should know he's the omniscient son of God. He knows everything. He's God all wise, the Bible says. So you can't outthink him and you can't dispute the truth of what he's saying because he's the very embodiment of truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me, John 14, 6. And what happens in this passage is the same as what always happens, that we've seen through the ages from antiquity to the present time that we've had our porphyry, we've had our uh, Celsus, we've had our David Humes, we've had our Voltaires and Rousseaus, we've had other people, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson and many others, that have attacked the biblical Christ. And they've not been able to dispute him. And today we have the new atheist movement, and already uh, they're kind of passe and long in the tooth in the eyes of many people. And a lot of people are kind of tired of Professor Dawkins and uh, many of the things he said, which have been ably answered uh, by Christian apologists. But, you know, the apologists aside, the Bible gives the answers to these people, and skeptics are really on the losing side, because eventually every knee is going to bow. Eventually every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's going to be seen who he is, that he is the incarnate Son of God, God who became flesh, who became a real man in every sense, except he wasn't fallen. He wasn't tainted by sin. He wasn't at all blemished. Morally, he was perfect, inwardly and outwardly. And that's why when we read the historic documents of the Gospels about his life, we find perfection. We find a beautiful life that human beings in their wildest imaginations and fancies could not invent because it is the very life of God written upon man. The Lord Jesus is the true image of the Father. He's the exact expression of his glory and uh, the effulgence of his glory, some translate in Hebrews 1, and he is the exact character or imprint of who God is. And so when you see the Lord Jesus, you've seen the Father, you see what God is like. Now the Lord Jesus answers them, of course, not only by reason and saying that there's a different order of things in the resurrection, but also from the scripture. He goes to chapter and verse, as it were, in what is referred to here as the burning bush passage, which you can look up in our modern Bibles. We call it Exodus chapter 3. And in that third chapter of Exodus, Moses has an encounter with God, a theophany, an appearance of God, where God shows himself in the bush that is burning and yet is not consumed. And it's in that passage that God says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. 
He was the God of the patriarchs. Now, at that point in time, that's about 1440 BC or so, or some say 1445. I won't quibble with them. But in that ne neck of the woods, at that time, these patriarchs have all been dead for hundreds of years. And so for God to say, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we would expect as human beings that grammar would dictate that the Almighty would say, I was the God of Abraham. When, God, when Abraham was here on earth, I was his God. I was Isaac's God as well. I was Jacob's God. I was their God as long as they lived on this earth. Well, what about after that? Well, there's no resurrection, you know, so uh, I'm not their God in that way anymore. No, he says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And the Lord Jesus goes on to explain that by saying, he's not the God of the dead, but of the living for all live to him. Now, that's extraordinary to think that human beings created in the image of God, albeit fallen, that we go on for forever. Where we go on, of course, is a matter of what we do with God's truth, what we do with the light that he has shown upon us, what we do in our age, we'd say, with the Lord Jesus Christ. What have you done with Christ? Who is Christ to you? Is he your Lord and Savior? Have you bowed the knee and asked him to save you from your sins? Have you ever thanked him for paying for those sins on the cross? Do you believe that he rose again so that you could be justified in God's sight? You could be declared righteous because of who Christ is and what he has done? And then you're saved. That's a wonderful thing. But if Christ is really nothing to you, or maybe Christ is that in case of emergency break glass sort of deity that when you get into trouble, you say, oh, I better pray. I better call out to Jesus now and ask him to help me. Or you say, well, maybe when I have a particularly difficult time in my life, then I'll say with the great country song, Jesus, take the wheel. Well, I don't think it's such a great song, frankly. But anyway, many people have that attitude. You know, I'm messing up my life. So come in and give me a better life. You know, that's not salvation. Salvation isn't about what your life is here and now. Salvation is about what God wants to make you for eternity. He wants to save you not only from the guilt of sin and the wrath that sin deserves, the righteous punishment that those sins deserve, but he wants to remake you into a new creature in Christ Jesus. He wants to make you like the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants to have you in glory like the Lord Jesus. And Mr. J. N. Darby in his great hymn, And Is It So?, uh, talks about all like thee for thy glory like thee lord object supreme of all by all adored we're all going to be like him and with him if we know the lord jesus christ of course if you neglect the lord jesus if you haven't believed on the lord jesus and you leave this world that way it will be a lost eternity an eternity that jesus himself described as being cast into outer darkness and he is the lord of all the earth and is the judge of all the earth will say, depart from me, ye who work iniquity, I never knew you. Well, my friend, that's needless. You don't need to do that. You don't need to be lost anymore, either in this life, and you certainly don't need to be lost for eternity, because the Savior has been provided. There's not salvation in any other, because there's no other name given under heaven among men, whereby we must be saved, Acts 4 tells us. And so, come to Christ, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, is what Acts chapter 16, verse 31 tells us. And this is what God loves to do. He loves to save people and say, now I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. I am the God of Keith. You could put your name in there. If you've believed on the Lord Jesus, receive the Savior for yourself. You've bowed the knee and you want him to be your Lord and God. You want his work to be applied to your account. You want to see him as your substitute. You know that when he died on the cross, he was dying for you. And that when he died also, you died with him. And he's risen again, and you've risen with him. So now to walk in newness of life. That's what it means to be born again. To have an entirely different change in our life. To be remade from the inside out uh, when we come to Christ. And the Lord transforms us by regeneration. We get that new life. And the Spirit of God comes to live within us and apply that new life. And we begin producing fruit for God and for his glory. And we live like the Lord Jesus. What was notable about the apostles, Acts chapter 4 tells us, 
is that they took note of them that they had been with Jesus. When you live with the Lord Jesus and walk with the Lord Jesus, you start to talk like him. You start to think like him. The Spirit of God writes his law in your mind and your heart. You begin to love what he loves and hate what he hates. And if you fall, he's always there to pick you up again to wash your feet. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he will never cast us away. He will never throw us aside. Having begun the good work of salvation for eternity in us, he will not stop until that work is absolutely complete. Well, pointing back to Exodus 3, the Lord says, I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God of Jacob. This eternal I am that I am, as he's called in the Old Testament, this God who had no beginning, this God who describes himself in Revelation in chapter 1 as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. This is the God who's the God of these patriarchs, a personal relationship with them. And that relationship was ongoing. Even hundreds of years after their death, these men still existed and related to God in the way that God was their God and they were his people. They were his subjects. They were in this wonderful saving relationship with God. And so he says, all live to him. You know, this idea of this life being the main thing and that when we die, well, it's all over and we cease to be. You only go around once. So, you know, have the most fun you can now in this world. It's a false notion. There is eternity. Eternity is coming. Are you ready for it? Will you be able to say, yes, God is my God now. In 2021, I love the Lord my God. He's the God who gave the Lord Jesus for me. The Lord Jesus, the Son of God, came and gave himself for me because he loved me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I have that life. It's begun for me now, and it's going to continue through all eternity. What a wonderful salvation we have. And so there is a resurrection. And even when the Lord Jesus, who described himself in John 11 as the resurrection and the life, even when he was put to death, that wasn't the end of the story. Uh, we sing a song sometimes, Lord of life to death once subject, bless her yet a curse once made. Of thy father's heart the object, yet in depths of anguish laid. Thee we worship, thee we praise, excellent in all thy ways. You see, that wasn't the end for the Lord. Acts 2 says, it was not possible for the bands of death to hold him. He rose again from the dead, and we sing again, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor o'er the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. Are you one of his saints? Are you one of the set-apart ones? Set apart because you've received God's grace in Christ. You've received salvation as a free gift because you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're a saint if you believe on the Lord, a set-apart one, a holy one. And God sees you as his people, and he's working in you now to apply that salvation and to work out in you the life that he's put in with, in you. And so it's a tremendous salvation that we have. Now, the scribes, uh, some of whom doubtless were sympathetic on the theological level to what the Lord said, the scribes said, teacher, you've spoken well. Well, it's awfully nice of them to compliment the Lord, but really, he doesn't need man's compliments. You know, when the wisest and most intellectual people say, Jesus is the smartest pe person that's ever lived. God is the all-wise God. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, as Colossians 2 says. When we take our intellect, as it were, and put it in the dust and say, compared to him, I know nothing, I'm but a child, we're only stating the obvious. We're only saying what is evident. God is so far above us. His ways are not our ways, nor his thoughts our thoughts. And yet it's wonderful, as the psalmist says, how great are your thoughts towards us. If we were to number them up, we couldn't count them, the Bible says. And here God thought of you before you were ever made. He thought of you to create you in the first place, and he thought of you to provide a savior for you. Now, have you ever thought of him? Have you ever said, you know, I've lived you know, 15, 20, 30 years, 60 years, 70 years, somewhere in between, somewhere over that perhaps. And I've lived all those years 
and I've never thanked the Lord for giving his son. I've never believed on the Lord Jesus. I've never thought that the crucifixion that happened in the first century there in Judea had anything to do with me. I didn't realize that was the altar where the Lamb of God took away the sin of the world, where he offered himself a sacrifice for our sins. And I want to come to God now, and I want to thank him and come to know him through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, to know him is to love him. And yet, uh, these men were kind of astonished at the answer. They marveled at it. But it says there in verse 40, after that, they dared not question him anymore. So this business of trying to refute the Lord Jesus, there's just no success in it. Men cannot do it. And they've been trying for millennia. And they can't tear apart God's word. The Bible stands. And the wisdom of the Lord Jesus Christ spans the ages and he speaks to us by his spirit today through this word and tells us what the truth is and if we don't want to acknowledge it it doesn't change the fact that it's still true and we certainly can't refute it or deny it successfully and one day the whole world will see it when he comes it says the tribes of the earth shall mourn and wail because of him i hope that's not you uh, better to be among those whom the lord told look up for your redemption draws nigh, that you're looking for the Lord to come as your Savior. And uh, believers in this age who are part of the church, we're looking for the Lord to come in the air and catch us up to be with him. He said, I will go away, but I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye may be also, he said in John 14. So if you have never done so, may you come to the Lord. But they stop asking the Lord questions at this juncture, he starts asking them questions, but that's a matter for another lesson. Thank you for listening.